Uh, wait, no, that, that was my mic. <laughs> Hello? Oh, okay. Awesome. How's everyone doing? It's been a while since the last uh, hack for Quoker, so it's been really nice to have everyone back. Um, yeah, today we've got a few little bits and bobs, uh, a few things to talk about. Uh, I'm going to do a little mini talk about computer science for young people, computer science for kids, and Ray is going to give us an excellent talk about science, communication, and all that type of stuff. I think I don't have to do the big intro for Engineer Cafe because I think everyone here knows enough about Engineer Cafe. I will go through maybe uh, a few of the little things that have been going on here, things like uh, We've had a few more events from like Stripe and Twilio, like long workshops, if you want to get involved using those products and you haven't used them before. Um, we've had, I think we're going to hear a podcast about design coming from Brienne in the next few weeks. So she's interviewing uh, women designers uh, from the community. So that's going to be really fun. Uh, yeah, I, we have a very complicated stream setup, which uh, I've been slaving over, but it's finally working great. So if anyone wants to come to a podcast or a stream, we'd really love that. Uh, also, the VR community is doing great. So we've had the VR challenge, we're at the second one this month. The deadline's the end of the month if you want to make a, a little VR thing. Uh, and the theme is geometry. So do with that what you will. And if you don't want to make one, you just want to mess around, next month, I think it's the 17th, is the VR challenge like playtest party. So if you just want to come playtest some stuff, try it out, see what people made. Feel, feel free to come along. There will be another event after that too. Yeah. Uh, does anyone have any like lightning talks or anything you want to uh, mm, announce or mention or upcoming events? Elixir events, anyone? Not yet? Okay. <laughs> That's all right. I'm going to do a quick mini talk about computer science for kids. I've done a little bit of it before. Um, it's a bit of a hot topic. So, going straight into it, a lot of the stuff you see now is all about coding. Coding camps, coding events at schools, code this, code that. Like, it's a big thing right, in education. Probably more so in other countries than Japan, but even in Japan, it's become a compulsory uh, topic. But I kind of think that we're missing out on the computer science side, right? We're doing lots of coding, lots of uh, fiddling around with things, but we're not really understanding it. So these activities are great if you've got some kids or you're talking with some young people. The unplugged activities really introduce the computer science uh, things really nicely, and they're very simple and they work very well, so I recommend that. Probably a very good for up to Sort of five. Very well done. <laughs> yeah, and we did uh, we did a bunch of these activities. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. I'll remember the next time. I'm sure. Um, this is binary yoga, where where kids make ones and zeros with their kind of bodies. Um, it's a very simple idea, but it works works really well. And you know, you get to practice all the counting reading, literacy, numeracy, all the other stuff uh, with kids. I know we're getting the international schools to come in and do some of the events similar uh, to this, maybe in the summer uh, as well. Weesh. Other things, um, maybe we've heard of this one, Scratch, really great little uh, block-based programming language, probably the kind of the original that's got really popular recently. Um, so it's easy to start, it's really well supported. It works very simply and easily. I recommend that if you want to do actual programming. Uh, another one that's great is Microsoft Code Creator because they've got like an arcade where you can make different activities, make uh, games very easily. Also, there's a little toggle so you can go from block programming to JavaScript, Python. So if you're getting your kids into that, that's uh, a great one. And then... Oh, Inkscript, a bit of a different idea, is an interactive fiction writing tool. It's not specifically aimed at kids or younger people, 
But if your kids are kind of interested in writing, interested in stories, you can use this tool to make uh, interactive fiction type experiences. Um, and it's very, very in-depth. It's really, really in-depth. It hooks into major game engines, like I think Godot and maybe Unity. Uh, it hooks into kind of web multimedia stuff. And some famous games have used it already. Uh, this is Overboard, where you repeat the same day, trying to basically push everyone overboard, or hide, cover up your murder. Um, it's a really funny, kind of interesting game, but very, very deep. Is there a typo? Oh, no. Yeah, well, if only they... I guess they had a deadline. OK. Yeah, but that one is quite fun. Uh, and of course, we're all... Well, a lot of us are developers, so... Blockly is a library for making block-based programming experience things. So if you have an idea for, like, a, a cool activity or a cool thing that young people or children might be interested in, you can use Blockly to just go and make it. Um, so I recommend getting into that. It's the same sort of thing, and it will output other programming languages too. Um, that was my quick run through of a bunch of tools that I've just been looking at recently to get ready for all this uh, programming language for younger people. I don't know if anyone else had any thoughts or any questions. Yeah, yeah can, we, can we pass? Oh, this table is too big. <laughs> oh, yeah, we could have just done that. <coughs> yeah. Um, Oh, it's on. Uh, Is it on? You, you mentioned you know, a lot of, you did mention a lot, um, uh, it is becoming kind of uh, necessary or like it's a requirement in schools now, especially for- That's right, yeah. Do you see like specific trends happening uh, here in Japan and are they different or similar to mm. anywhere around the world or is there like a different focuses that are happening mm, internationally? Mm, mm. Yeah, so the basic the question is, is there any trends in Japan versus other countries? Is there any differences, similarities? The biggest trend, I think everywhere, is, hey, we don't have enough teachers. <laughs> because basically, you know, math, science, English have been around for a while. Everyone's pretty used to them. The system's all kind of built up around them. And now countries are saying, OK, we want every single school, every single primary school in the whole country to teach computer science or teach programming, and there's just no one, right? I've had maybe three people come here to the Engineer Cafe be like, I'm a teacher. I've uh, been told I have to teach this next year. I've got no idea what I'm doing. What next? So I think maybe the things that we can do. But what, what, teach, what subject were they teaching? One of them was an English teacher. One of them was a math teacher, I think. I don't know about the other one. Um, I think a lot of math teachers, science teachers get pulled into it. Um, so my kids' primary school teacher, they, they each class is doing a scratch. Their primary school teacher is teaching everything. Yeah. And the kids are actually teaching the teachers. Yeah. A bunch of the kids are doing scratch. Yeah. And they're, they're like, oh, this is how you do it. And the teacher's like. <laughs> right. Yeah, because primary is a, you're a generalist teacher. You know, you have to be able to play the piano and you have to be able to do a little bit of English. <laughs> yeah. So that's where I think stuff like this um, unplugged. It's very accessible to teachers. You know, teachers can do things with cards and dice and counters and running around the floor. And I think it's probably more worthwhile to do this than programming, because this is timeless, right? If you learn about the ideas, you know, you can apply them to any programming language. So if you want to com contribute, this is all kind of open source. You can make new activities. So if you have a cool idea for an activity, do this. You know, add something to their project. It's really nice. Hmm. That's about everything. Any other questions? What was the third slide? Yeah. Oh, sorry, the fourth slide. <laughs> Scratch. This is a block programming language. It's, you know, kiddy and colorful, but pretty serious. I did some of the advent of code in Scratch just to show it could be done. Uh, not the most ergonomic. It's really well designed. <laughs> yeah. The, the language itself. Yeah, it works, right? It works. Uh, uh, sorry. So, for, about computer science. So, a lot of those examples, except for the mm. first one, are blocked programmers, which is coding, basically. Yes. So, what sort of things do you think, 
I, except for coding, yeah. Yeah, from computer science that are accessible to teach mm. kids and how have also resources. Yeah, um, there's not a lot, but I think a lot of the basics are accessible. Uh, there's another, there's a TV show actually called, is an NHK TV show called Tekishiko, which is like programming thinking basically. And that is like Pythagoras switch, but with um, programming computer science ideas. And there's actually no programming in the show. It's all just like, try and imagine what would happen next, or try and move these things in your head and predict, and do all this, the kind of thinking uh, that involves this kind of programming computer science. I think computer science is quite accessible because if you imagine what people learn in their first year of computer science at university, a lot of people are coming from the basics. And if you just simplify those basics a little bit, the idea of putting things in order, following steps, all this kind of, uh, you know, some of the basics of computational complexity. If you don't use difficult words and maths, it's quite accessible. Yeah. But uh, the teachers don't know that. So I think we have to tell them. Yeah. Yeah, I just had a question. I think it's quite similar to that one, actually. It's basically, number two, I kind of see as being an onboarding in a way, but do you yeah. have sort of an idea of like what a good sort of like curve for, uh, for learning this would be, or what, what a good way to kind of on or out? Like a, like a curriculum? Or... Yeah, right? Like if you start, depending on age and, and sort of what sort of path you might take. Mm. I, I think it kind of depends on the, the child a little bit. Um, from what I've seen of more children-focused events here, you know, some people come, uh, like little uh, primary school kids, they want to make a game, and they'll spend a whole day making the game, like playing around with Scratch. And I think that's a good place to kind of get them into it. Um, you know, writing the code, seeing the results. I, I don't think there's any particular order that, I've, that I think about or know about, which is really the way to go. Um, right now, I think in schools as well, it's quite unstructured. People are kind of getting uh, into it, doing whatever activities they've got, but they just don't have much to do. There's more and more coding schools popping up as well. Um, Thank you. Yeah. What, have you looked into like, Minecraft coding or anything for here you can do as well? So I haven't, I haven't looked into Minecraft coding for here. The, that's what you get. Like, I swear everyone of my kids' friends like, mm. want to make stuff for Minecraft. And Microsoft are really restrictive with the yeah. license. To, you've got to be an educational establishment in order to get the developer Minecraft tools. Did not know that. And we might be able to get it. I don't know. Interesting because a lot of interest in it. <laughs> mm. I'll have to look into it. Thank you. Um, with the you know, kind of question regarding with the plate of the teachers coming in trying to yes. to teach all yeah. this. Does like what is exactly the curriculum that is like determined that the, that like the Japanese government is saying like like what level they need I'm to not get? I'm not sure. I don't know the details off the top of my head. I think it was year four in primary school, was it? When they it's could become compulsory. Um, a lot of stuff like English has kind of gone to becoming more yeah. compulsory lower down as well. And I think we all know how kind of the top down works? stuff is working out. So, um, job for English teachers? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, I, don't, I don't know the details of what's on the curriculum. I was um, actually in my daughter's class yesterday. There was mm. like a day with the parent teacher the school. Um, what grade is it? Uh, first grade. First grade. Um, and I, I don't really have too much to add, just I felt a lot of sympathy for the teacher as yeah. there were 31 mm. kids, um, you know, opening, the, opening their, uh, their tablets and then the yeah. mics are howling everywhere. And like, <laughs> ah, I was like, mm. Yeah. First grade. Yeah. yeah no, I, I thought it was really cool that they were introducing it and mm. the kids were mm. very quick to, you know, um, I actually initially kind of corrected my daughter because he started touching the screen. I didn't realize that uh, Chromebooks mm. are, are like you can, mm. you can manipulate Oh, it is a touch screen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So your kid gets a Chromebook from the school, they take it, she takes it home? Yeah. No, it's not the school, but they each got one with right. their name on it. From year, I think it's three or four, they bring it home. So I bring it home. Mm. Yeah. My, my older girl, is, she's yeah, grade yeah. five this year, she's got, a, um, she's got a Chromebook in her class. But both my girls, we're, this is extracurricular, we've um, signed up for any parents out there with kids. Uh, Tarenji Tachi, it's like a, a tablet computer, it's very reasonable, you get to keep the computer. 
the tablet afterwards, and it follows the school's curriculum. I'm sorry, we're digressing a little. That's all right. <laughs> Go for it. A little more. Well, I know to my older girl, like she'd been. I think the kids are jumping on this in the morning and touching. I want to do the challenge touchy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're doing all the stuff following the curriculum, and, and uh, my older girl's like in class, and the teacher's telling them stuff. She's like, mm. I know this stuff. I think uh, I think this is like two great points about how when tech doesn't work, it kind of really can go off the deep end and just nothing works. And then when tech works, great, like kids can love it and they really enjoy doing it. Yes, the whole group. Mm. I think everyone's turning it on and off. Mm. It's on mute all the time. Anyway, <laughs> if you're worrying why it's not sounding. Because yeah, it's on mute. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny because they're also they have to do all of that like um, they have to make slides and they have to use like Google Sheets and uh, Google um, I said it's spreadsheet, not the spreadsheet, oh, sorry, the, the uh, PowerPoint. Oh, what, what grade yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's sick, uh, he's sick year six at the moment, but that's been for the past, what, two years I've been doing it. Um, mm. Anyway, uh, I'm going to like save this discussion for later <laughs> because uh, get the schedule going through. So uh, that was my talk. I'm sure we'll have lots of chat about this uh, after, after the presentations, but I'm going to pass over. <laughs> really, really unnecessary. Um, yeah, going to pass over to Ray from Kyushu University, telling us all about uh, communication in science and technology. Let's just do the switch over. Okay. Ooh. All right, all right, all right, all right. Coming in all right. You might want to turn my volume down if I'm speaking, or speaking too um, loudly. Okay. Let's wait until this loads up. Yeah, too bad I don't have a, uh, the, the actual Akarenga background, so it could be a little Seinfeld-ish. Yeah. What's the deal with science communication? <laughs> okay. Uh. I was told I should stand here to make sure I... Okay. Um, hello, <laughs> everybody. Good evening. Uh, my name is Raymond Terhune. Uh, you know, friends call me Ray. Uh, I am a science communicator at Kyushu University up in uh, Ito campus right now. I, it's not like an academic position, it's in the uh, public relations initiative <laughs> right here. So it's like the PR office. I'll talk about a little bit of what I exactly do um, in the context of the presentation. But uh, I've been doing this for a little while and I was asked by Lori to uh, speak about basically science communication. What is it? How does it work? And then I'll, I'll try to add a little bit about what, like, in the context of maker spaces and engineering cafes like we are today. So I'd like to thank Lori at Engineering Cafe for asking me to talk. I'm always excited to, to evangelize a little bit of what I do and the importance of science communication. It's just a little bit of a background of myself. Uh, you know, the classic academic principal. Yeah, as I was in Kyushu University right now. Before this, until last May, I was actually at uh, Kyoto University doing um, kind of similar work in their Office of Global Communications. Um, my background is uh, developmental biology. So I was doing a lot of cell biology works and genetics work. So actually hearing a lot of uh, talk around here is very new and uh, nice educational for me. Um, and you know, I was just doing a lot of more wet work biology stuff there and then, but my Undergraduate background is really just in um, you know liberal arts. So I was you know majored in biochemistry and molecular biology, but at the end of the day, after my lab, I'd go and do go and have to do the literature or the uh, or the uh, you know Middle East politics course uh, right afterwards. So you know, I tried to have a diverse background, and that's kind of the what's important for a science communicator. So uh, I'm just going to do a little bit of. Uh, workshop here if you have your phones or you want to join in on this. I, I just like to gauge this every time I uh, get people and while this happens, I have to actually start this <laughs> while it's going. Um, I, I, I guess we can just let this go and people can see what 
kind of stuff goes on, but I think, let me just uh, quickly open up the, oh, there we go. So what do you think of when you hear science communication? Uh, there's probably something everybody's heard about. Uh, you're, you're welcome to answer as many, you know, many things as you want, but uh, I like bangs and explode. Ooh, that's good. Ooh, I like that. A lot of, of course, yeah, I guess if you're, depending on what era you grew up in and what kind of TV <laughs> or media you experienced, it could really change on um, what it is. So uh, I'm going to be publishing it. <laughs> Uh, that's good. That's that's new. I've never have seen that one before. Um, let me see here. It's good. So I'll just let this run for a little bit longer. <laughs> that's equal to square. That's good. That's good. That's uh. <laughs> Sorry. So yeah, of course, like. Uh, as we go through this, we'll know that like science communication is very diverse. There's a lot of a lot of stuff can be considered science communication. So let's um, I'll let that go, but uh, let's continue on with the presentation here. Oh, this is hard to go through. Eh. Okay. Oh. Oh. So the very yeah the basic definition or the dictionary definition of uh, science communication is the practice of informing, educating, and raising awareness of science-related topics. So it's pretty, you know, it's pretty straightforward. It's basically making science understandable for everyone. And then when it comes to science, it's just, you know, it's a massive field. So it's basically making all these, whether it be scientific principles or certain research or modern current research you know understandable to the public uh my more focus or my personal focus is the is to raise scientific literacy and the public understanding of science and because i, I believe that you know being able to having higher scientific literacy and a better understanding of science leads to better community more informed people and better world overall. Uh, it also comes in a lot of shapes and sizes. These are just some of the people like, you know, just that I pulled out. Um, probably the, if you're my age around and you're American, uh, Carl Sagan perhaps is a uh, popular uh, science communicator. He was an astrophysicist in Harvard who uh, made the show Noah on PBS, which is a big influence to a lot of people my age. Uh, you have more, you know, current stuff, uh, Chris Kukat, I can't even pronounce that, uh, that's a YouTube channel uh, that does a lot of animations and talking about, uh, sci you know, current science stuff. Uh, then there's, in Japan, there's, we were just talking about the coding uh, for children part, like uh, Kagakuto Gakushu is a little, like, you know, kind of monthly, monthly, or like quarterly, uh, you know, magazine slash, you know, kits that kids can use to, uh, you know, learn about science. Uh, my favorite person is uh, Mark Abrams, who's the founder of the Ig Nobel Prize. Uh, he's kind of a personal hero of mine, but also now a friend <laughs> that I've had the honor of meeting through this job. Then you have, you know, journalists and uh, some more like institutional ones, like the National Science Muse uh, National Museum of Nature and Science up in Tokyo. Of course, here in Fukuoka, in Lopomatsu, you have the uh, Fukuoka Science Museum. The, the Mirai Kan is probably the most famous in Japan to have like, uh, is a science museum in Tokyo that actually hires science communicators and is a, like a big, you know, a proponent of having, especially kids, understand about scientific principles. Then you have more like, you know, different mediums, so it's like science manga artists like Hayano, uh, Takiki Honda here, he's a freelance science communicator out in Kansai. Uh, and then more, I guess more recently in Japan, people like Taichi Masu, who was a, um, like a really famous television announcer here in Japan, who retired from a very lucrative 
uh, you know, announce their career to become, or to become like an academic at Doshishi University in Kyoto in the field of science communication. So, eh. so you know, many people, many institutions, all shapes and sizes, all shapes and sizes for science communication. So now this is the second question. This is the only, I'm only asking two questions in the whole thing. I think if you keep, if you've kept on the same uh, site, you should be able to get it, but I forgot to start it up. So just hold on a second, please. Okay. So now the question is, why is science communication? That's not a typo, I just like using that. But so what, what, why does science communication even exist? Why does my job, why, why does Kyushu University pay like a, a schlub like me to do science communication for a university? So let me go to the thing again. Okay, why does science communication exist? I think if we're all here, you like, probably have some kind of idea, maybe like, like that's good, that's good. <laughs> Ooh, that's, okay. That, I've seen that actually quite a few times, so that's great. <laughs> well, this is why I'm here, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> I do, yeah, I mean, eh. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, that's good. Oh, on YouTube, yes, yes, oh man. New, like, the, like, YouTube and social media is like, has absolutely revolutionized how science communication is done and the audience that it could reach. Where are we here? There we go. Actually, I should just look on this side. Uh, okay, why is science communication? <laughs> okay, so we got through a lot of this. This is just like a lot of stuff that I've like, collected over the years. I think one of the big things um, or the more, you know, po uh, political aspect is this, um, as taxpayers, you know, we, we all pay taxes, I hope. <laughs> we, we are stakeholders to um, any kind of science, public science funding, and then we deserve to know what it is, like what the science is about, or what is our taxpayers funded. In fact, in Japan, like a majority of all science funding is publicly funded. The states uh, where um, there's a lot of like uh, philanthropic organizations, but uh, Japan um, is like mostly publicly funded. So, you know, as taxpayers, we, you know, we deserve to, we paid for it, like why, we should know exactly what our money is going to. Of course, we've mentioned, you know, raising scientific literacy, promoting research for, from a specific institute or university, you know, like if you're focused on biology or engineering or chemistry, like pharmaceutical stuff is a lot is, is informed. Uh, you know, and then an informed and educated public leads to a better and safer community. We thought that came up, in, I think, um, in the questionnaire. Uh, raising awareness, or like general awareness of the world you live in. Uh, informing public policy is also another important thing. If you want the, if you want the government or the policymakers to implement, you know, the, you know, proper laws and regulations for, your for, um, you know, this is for society and the community. Of course, if you're more business focused, you have know, R and D, informing shareholders. Also, recent, especially the last couple of years, this is a big thing, combating, combating misinformation. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of bad people producing a lot of bad sh information. It's, can't even call it information at this point. Uh, a lot of bad stuff uh, online. So recently, a lot of t people are, a lot of science communicators are coming up to, you know, combat that. Also, building the community, like we are here today, getting people together, knowing about people with a common goal. Also raising public understanding, improving the economy. This is also kind of, you know, policy aspects. And then also, this is a little nationalistic, which I don't like going into it, uh, talking about so much, but like promoting a country's yeah. research is one thing. I mean, I guess since I work for a national university, that's kind of what something I do as well. But, you know, it's, it, if be, being able to promote the country's research also can bring in investment and talent for researchers. Okay, so how exactly does science communication happen? Uh, it's quite simple, really. Um, you know, a scientist, 
or scientists uh, will produce like a research result, a research paper, you know, something published in Nature or Science or any of the hundred, actually thousands of, of you know, pu uh, publicly available publications out there. It goes to the science communicator and they produce, they transfer that to an audience in the, con in for, in, in a way that that audience can understand. And there's a lot of audiences, obviously. There's, you know, there's general public, web outlets, other scientists or students specifically. Um, and then like the news media and journalists, the people who will, you know, science communicators talk to these people and then the, that comes out in the news a lot. Uh, and then also policy makers is another big thing as well. Science communicators advising, you know, for proper policies to be produced. Uh, obviously, you know, we are, it is 2022 and with such advents of, you know, profound you know, connectivity, especially with social media, scientists can directly go to these audiences now. A lot of, especially a lot of young researchers um, over the world, and especially Japan is, is really um, pumping up on this, is that younger researchers, they understand it's important that they can talk to the public or have, you know, the public is going to ask them anyway. So being able to put up a public face to talk about their research or talk about certain uh, public events is actually really important. And so and sometimes science communicators um, don't need, are, are not even acting as facilitators anymore, but you know, so scientists are going to all these places. But you know, science communicators still are a necessary uh, factor in all of this. The, it, it isn't just science, uh, scientists' work and papers, of course. It's also like just general scientific information. You can focus on you know things like biology or you know engineering or computer science, chemistry. I don't know what the hell this is. Like it's a human skull with a nuclear, <laughs> and so it's you know uh, maybe let's say MRI stuff. Um, and so you can also like kind of spe focus on a specific subject, and you know as a science communicator, use that to promote to your audience. The media, and then you know how do you do it is another thing too. What the mediums to use for as a science communicator, and that's a lot as well. You can use many kinds of mediums you want. Uh, you know, films, whether it be like interviews or documentaries, you know, audio on like radios or podcasts, your presentations, like today, you know, public lectures or science cafes is a thing in Japan that's really popular. Obviously social media and then writing as in like articles or press releases is more closely to something that I do. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of the, that's the pipeline, right? So in, in essence, if you want to do science communication, you can take like any one of these parts and just like mix and match on what you want to do, what you can do and like expand out to what you do. So let's kind of like explore a little bit of like some of this mixing and matching we can do. I really wish it was a little bit darker, but okay. So for example, say if you take like, you, know, you, you do like basically all topics related to science in an audio format, to more of a general public, you get you know, podcasts and radios. Like uh, Science Friday is an NPR show in the United States. In Japan here, there's uh, Science Otoku, which is a Japanese uh, group. Um, I'm not so familiar with like, the scope of like, podcasting in Japan. I know it's like a thing, but every time I look through Apple Podcasts, uh, you know, top 10, it's usually like Eikaiwa stuff. <laughs> so I'm just not so sure how well the science focuses on that. Alternatively, if you're if you want to do like recent like more science, the recent reports from scientists as well as general topic stuff, and using solely social media in the from a general public, you have like this site, this uh, Facebook page called Open Science. A colleague of mine uh, runs this. It's basically an aggregator for some science news uh, that's coming or that's being covered by Japanese press and media. Uh, let's see, other ones, ah, here we go. So we have, if you're taking general topics or recent research in, and presenting in the form of presentation or writing to policymakers, this is one thing. This is actually really you know, important. Now you have a lot of organizations and people who work in the government. You know, there are science policy and science advisors in every, uh, you know, every government. So here's uh, in the UK, you have Sir Patrick Valence in the chief science advisor. Um, uh, Al Alondra Nelson um, is the Director of Office of Science and Technology Policy in the US. 
Um, and then in Japan, there's the Science Council of Japan, the Nihon Gakujutsu Kaigi, which is a coalition of uh, um, academics and, well, it's mostly like university uh, professors um, that meet and kind of lay out certain advice, lay out certain uh, science-based policies or produce ad or advice, advise on certain policies in general. Uh, We'll just kind of skip through this. So, and then let's see, if you're doing, okay, I tried to do this, but this, I tried to explain like climate and climate change <laughs> in, in all of these. There wasn't like a icon for climate change, but if you're doing like an eye of climate change using film and social media for a general public audience, then you have a lot of like YouTube channels. And so for example, um, Climate Town is, you know, this uh, guy who, you know, does more comedic uh, videos on, regarding you know, climate change and climate policy. Uh, and then, so now we'll get, so a little bit for my, if you're, you're doing like more scientific research side, like the recent research coming out of universities, and you're writing it and producing it to news media, journalists, and web outlets, that's uh, people like me, institutional science communicators. Uh, this is my team, well my team, so like we're, there's no hierarchy here, but this is the team at Kyushu University we work on. Um, we have, so that's me, that's another um, more natural sciences uh, science communicator and she is a humanities and social science uh, science communicator for uh, Kyushu University. What we do is basically take like the latest research that a, you know, a professor has written. They say like, oh, we're about to publish a paper in this, this journal. We'll talk, and I want to like, talk about it to the press or want to have it like be promoted um, over the world. So we'll talk to them, we'll try to strategize in ways. And usually when it comes to writing like a press release that summarizes that paper, uh, about 400 to 600 words, and then we send, and then we send it out to wires and uh, journalists that we have on file. So uh, I cover you know, basically everything in the natural sciences. So even as a biologist, I have to cover, I, I just covered one about like um, AI uh, robustness, which took me like two weeks to finally parcel through. <laughs> um, and then these are other institutional science communicators. I, like I just picked these out. I'm, I know there's a lot more, but this is my old boss actually at Kyoto University. Um, and so all these people work for institution, academic institutions or universities and uh, you know, produce, write press releases or talk to foreign press to, or at least in the international sense, right? To internationally promote uh, you know, research coming out of their university. Somebody once called me a propagandist for the university. So I was like, yeah, you know, you're not wrong. <laughs> Um, but I think today we'll, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit, focus more about these community focused regarding science communication since we are here at Engineering Cafe. Um, you know, if we're the, you know, going back to here, if we're taking like more recent research in the, or on a topic of say computer science in many forms, but more presentation writing social media to the general public or, you know, other scientists or students in general, I think these, we can, think of like maker spaces and hacker spaces like engineering cafe or loft work. Well, loft work is a company, it's not a place, but loft work are places that are kind of hubs for science communication or community focused science communication that focuses on you know, computer science and technology. So yeah, essentially hacker spaces, maker spaces, I think this is just gonna be a you know, review for everybody in this room today. But yeah, it's a, it's a communal public workshop where people can work on personal projects. And it tends to be a lot uh, focused on, you know, co uh, computer science coding and, um, you know, making, uh, yeah, and then like making stuff, you know, using laser cutters or 3D printers. Um, they usually are, uh, you know, facilities where people come together to collaborate or work by themselves. I think there's a big focus on collaboration in a lot of these places. Uh, generally, the machines that they have are publicly available. You know, like if you, if you, especially here in Japan, if you don't have the money or the space to have like 3D printers or laser cutters or audiovisual equipment, those these maker spaces are generally available, and. You know, ever since they, their inception, uh, it's certainly a growing place for education and science communication. This is a, a place in, uh, this is a material in Kyoto, 
uh, that's a maker space down in near Gojo. Uh, and they're doing, I think this is like a um, science and art uh, presentation here. So it brings a lot of people together like this. Um, in Japan alone, there's 130 facilities uh, that, can that can be considered like maker spaces. Um, which, and you know, of course these places are kind of, you know, mil melding up and becoming also like co-working spaces as well, especially the last couple of years with the COVID pandemic. They're expanding their equipment and it's, it's not just uh, your standard, your know, 3D printer and your laser cutter. Uh, and also pl places like here, at least they have Fukuoka, who are kind of like hubs and outreaching areas for, you know, for the lo for local community as well as like businesses and startups as well. Uh, also backed by the local government, some places are like here, and then, you know, ob obviously collaborating with universities and other academic institutions to bring people together to form a community. Uh, I'm a biologist by trade, so when I was looking through this, I was thinking, well, are there any like biohacking places? I mean, there's there's a lot of like o overhead that's required for you know if you want to make a maker space or a co-working space for biology, but there are, there is like this DIY biology movement, this biohacker movement, which is essentially a maker space or hacker spaces with a focus on biology and life science. Um, this in the sense began early as 2005, I think, or this concept of like DIY biology. And it covers a lot of these topics like bioinformatics, genetic engineering, entomology, so like, like bug stuff is really big, I guess for kids, kids love bug stuff. Um, and then finally, like if you have the enough facilities, you can do like cell biology and gene engineering stuff. It, there's a lot of, there's, all, we can talk a lot. I can like go on about like just the costs alone to, set up stuff and then maintain it because there's a lot of like maintenance that goes into biology experience. And then there's things like the Open Insulin Project in the US that focuses on medicine, uh, to, like trying to make, bringing people together to make cheaper, version, cheaper and available insulin. And then science art is also a big thing that uh, these biohacking places do. Um, in Japan, there's this, I can only find one, I could only find a couple, and this is one of the bigger ones I thought, which is the um, Bio Club, which is in Tokyo called Fab, at Fab Cafe Material, uh, that has like, I actually looked at their list of what they have, and it's like, yeah, it's a decent, halfway decent lab. They have like a couple of thermal cyclers for PCR and uh, decent fume hoods. I definitely, if, when I go to Tokyo, I'll check this place out. And then there's um, DIY Bio, I think is the other big one that's more international. Um, that it's basically a consortium of these places that uh, either bring together communities for biohacking or like our facilities for, for people, open DIY biology labs. Okay, and then in the final part, I'd like to talk a little bit about like community-based events. And specifically, I'm gonna talk about Nerd Night Kyushu here. But uh, yeah, basically if you're taking either, you know, recent research from scientists or general topics, and focusing on presentation and social media to the general public and other science and students, you have more community-focused events and presentation stuff. Um, as uh, this Nerd Night Kyushu one is actually a event, is something that I am involved in or I started here in Kyushu just last month. And I'm going to evangelize a little bit about that since I have the stage. You can't go anywhere today. <laughs> um, so like, yeah, Nerd Night Kyushu or, and, uh, which is kind of, well, Nerd Night is the big organization, and then depending on what city you're starting it, you can put your city here. So, Nerd Night, what is Nerd Night? Um, this started back in 2003. Uh, this is the uh, founder here, Chris Balakrishnan, who, you know, basically this is, this is the um, official description of Nerd Night. We're a very loosely knit community, which, so we can do whatever the fuck all we want. Um, but it's a wickedly fun and informative presentation series held once a month, generally, in multiple cities throughout the world. Uh, you know, set in public venues where two to three presenters share a topic of personal interest or expertise in a fun yet intellectual format while the audience shares a drink. This is actually a really important part. <laughs> One of the very few rules of Nerd Night is that you have to, it has to be at a venue where you can actually have a drink <laughs> and share. Um, 
Discovery Channel with beer was the unofficial tag. <laughs> so it is old. It was made in 2003. <laughs> I think we should change that a little bit. Um, and then in 2006, uh, you know, you know, Chris convinced his friend uh, Matt Wazowski to hold it in New York when he moved over there. He, um, and then now today, uh, Nerd Night is actually held in over 100 cities globally. And in Japan alone, there's actually four. Uh, Tokyo, Kansai, Kyushu, those that we're here today, and Okinawa. Uh, before coming, you know, moving to Kyushu, I was actually running uh, Nerd Night Kansai. Uh, in fact, up in when I in kind of in between Kyoto and Osaka. Uh, so yeah, there's there's me with the um, the team. Actually, these two here are the organizers for Nerd Night Tokyo, um, and you know this is this is the team for Nerd Night Kansai. Uh, you know we have it at these kinds of events. We have the presentation. And we just bring together people to share a drink and have some fun. So what kind of topics do we cover at Nerd Night? Honestly, anything nerdy and entertaining, that's the rule. And then you have to have a drink. Um, some of our past speakers at Nerd Night Kansai, at least, were like um, you know, Dr. Emily Menard, who studies gender and society in Japan, who also showed up in NHK. Like, like a week after this presentation, uh, they showed up Genda uh, Taiso on NHK. And also um, doctors, people like the Dr. Rebecca Johnson, who is currently the chief scientist at the Smithsonian in Washington, DC. Uh, she was a visiting researcher at Kyoto at the time, and I convinced her to show up and speak. And, but then, like, it's basically anything, any nerdy that could be fun. We have people, uh, these instructors of acro yoga, talking about the acro yoga and demonstrating it here. Um, Dr. J.B. Brown, who talks about AI and medical research. He's a Kyoto, uh, he was a Kyoto University researcher at the time. Or uh, John LaFleur, who is a you know, freelance video game, uh, freelance localizer for video games. So, it, so basically anything uh, nerdy is possible. The inaugural event was just last month, last month, uh, on March 20th, here at the Dancing Penguin. Uh, down in Takishita, that's just south of, uh, that's one station south of Hakata Station. Uh, Rarapoto is going to be opening there, I think, uh, on Monday there, it's in this area. Um, so yeah, it's a big place where people share a drink and see some nerdy talks. Our next uh, Nerd Night Kyushu is going to be on May 22nd on Sunday at 5 p.m. at the same place at the Dancing Penguin in Kakuuchi. Uh, we have, um, uh, if you're interested in that, um, I'm happy to give a little bit more information about it. You can go to our website or join our line group even. Um, we have dates for uh, you know the next com the upcoming ones. Uh, Nerd Night number three uh, at, at the Dancing Penguin on July 23rd and. I hope, I'm, I, hope, I hope we can put this on the schedule, but we're having to plan, planning to have one here uh, on October 1st uh, on that. We're still looking for speakers on this one, so if people are interested in speaking, please talk to me. <laughs> we're, always, we're always looking for new speakers. That's like the most, the hardest thing about all this. Yeah, please feel free to contact me uh, or visit our website or join our line group. Uh, you can talk to me and we can, or Lori. He's actually helping out with Nerd Night now <laughs> as well. Um, okay, I mean, I just have a few more things. If, like, is, do, does anybody interested in me talk for, <laughs> does anybody want to hear me like advise like how, if you want to do science communication, how, just the basics of how do you do science communication? Can you go through this real quick? Just real quick? Okay, finally, you can do it too. Not, you know, as, as we showed, science communication can come in many different forms. You can use any kind of medium you want and present to it. Do any kind of topic you're interested in and talk to basically any kind of audience. The, but, you know, the, some of the core things that you need, you know, that you need are is, is the follows. Be a fan of science. Just have, you know, make it make it like a hobby, you know, Knowing about science news or like what's happening right now is uh, is is important or that specific topic. You know, I I I do science communication as a job, but like I wake up every morning and I look through some of the science news that I'm interested in just casually as a thing. And you know, when I have time, it's like, oh, what's happening right now? What's what are the recent papers coming out? And that that's that's an important thing. It just casually keeps you in the mindset of like looking out for new science stuff. Um, have a wide range of knowledge um, because 
connecting different topics together is a lot is kind of necessary when doing science communication. Talking about stuff, especially if it's complex, being able to you know, and then that leads into like here molding your creativity with that because using metaphors, for example, is really important to doing proper science communication, getting people interested in how, you know, in certain stuff. So, you know, if you're, and depending on the audience, you can always uh, try to be creative in how you present. Then find the medium you're interested in. Uh, I'm like, I don't think I'm a good writer, but apparently I'm an all right writer, that, so I can, I've been told, so I have my career right now. But, you know, if you're good at video, if you're good at radio stuff, that's, you know, focus on that. If you're good at like talking to people, then you know, if that's a good focus to work on. And any meeting you're comfortable with is the best. And finally is to be confident uh, because good communication needs confidence in the way you speak and the way you work. And that's probably the hardest part of all. <laughs> oh, uh, but it takes practice, but it is something that is absolutely doable for anybody. All right, and that is the deal with science communication. Thank you very much. I am so sorry I went way too long. Oh, thank you very much. Um, if there are any questions directly uh, focused on science communication in the talk, I don't know if anyone wants to ask. Okay. Go on then. And I have cards for Nerd Night. Make sure this is pushed all the way up. Um, it uh, thank you. Um, so I noticed, uh, particularly in the past year, that uh, in the media, there's a major tendency to report on like breaking, breaking mm. research. It's, even like on like a preprints, yeah, yeah, stuff that isn't reviewed yet. I was just wondering if you had any uh, what your experience has been trying to get reporters excited about like uh, reviews and other mm. like high quality evidence that they should be paying attention mm. to. Yeah, that that's true. It doesn't feel so like hot. I guess. Yeah. So the how how do you get people interested? How do you get reporters interested in not just covering what the breaking the hot topics are, but like other topics or other or more might be might not make the news immediately, but it is important science nonetheless. Yeah, um, I mean I can go for another hour about just the pre <laughs> my ideas of preprints, and that's certainly changed in the last two two three years, but. Yeah, um, my focus, like that's what a big thing I focus on. Um, I'm a, you know, by, by trade or like my research background is very basic research. So it's research that is just, it's research done for the sake of science, the science for the sake of science. And that if somebody asks like, oh, what were, is this gonna be useful to me? And it's like, I don't know, maybe 30 years, who knows? <laughs> and um, there, there is that, uh, yeah, there's a lot of proponents and you know, uh, a lot of people are focusing on just like the value of basic research. But it's always nice to, now I've learned that even it, when you're talking about basic research, being able to like connect that to like current, to like current events or more, you know, uh, what's happened, you know, for people that more general public can understand. So even if it is like a really fun, I'm actually working on a paper right now that focuses on like a really fundamental, like aspect of cell biology in the brain, but it's like a fantastic paper that's like make that is up in like nature or something. But it doesn't have a lot. It doesn't have a lot of pull with the press. I actually just talked to them two days ago about this. I was like, I don't know. So now my strategy is to okay. Well, what do these specific cells do, or what does this pathway tell us about, like either human life, or and then it's, and then you say like, oh, okay, fundamentally these there's this big focus right now in you know for example saying like, oh researchers are focusing on this focusing on this specifically because say it connects to Alzheimer's work or you know um, yeah uh, blah, 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 or like autism or understanding autism better um, and. And, you know, while, while and it like, and that's the, at the fundamental level, essentially, so like at the core. Um, and, you know, that, that starts to get a little bit of people like talking, but then from there it's like, now you have to explain what these cells do, da da da, da. <laughs> and that's, that becomes the hardest part for me. And yeah, I'm, I'm, it's still a learning process, but I guess the, it's fundamental, the, the fundamental thing to do is to, some way connect it with you know, what people care about right now or like the hot, hotter topic and 
you know, molding your creativity to try to connect that, right? <laughs> but, don't, you don't, but don't lie. It always has to be scientifically accurate. Yeah, <laughs> I hope that answers your question. Any other question? Do you consider ethics part of the um, scope of communicating about science? Like, you know, I can teach you how to make a bomb, but maybe you shouldn't. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, thankfully, I, you know, I, I don't have, I, I don't feel like my work will be responsible for the person to like actually Not make a bomb. Part. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, like, you know, especially if something like bioethics, you're know, going back to my background, it's like, okay, bioethics now, what do you, what do you talk about? Like, yeah, like genetic engineering or saying like, can't, we're at the point now like you can actually make a human from say like IPS cells or like stem cells. That, that, that is inherently possible. Yeah, or like, oh yeah, or that, that guy who uh, was transplanted a pig heart uh, and survived for two months. The, like, at the point, you can explain, like, you know, I will talk about and explain, like, how exactly nitty to do that is fine, but it's, unless you have those facilities. What? He was a criminal, so that's okay. Well, no, 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 it's nothing like that. It's just basically the facilities of trying to do that up to that point is, you know, that, that's the hard, biggest barrier of entry to do. It's not impossible to do that. Now, like, the, Especially with the DIY biology stuff, like there's a lot of like this, and with CRISPR being so prevalent um, in the last, oh, it's been a decade now. Uh, and it's so much easier to genetically engineer stuff. Yeah, in the beginning, there was this uh, fear of like, oh, wow, like you can just engine, if you have the right facilities, you can engineer the, uh, a virus in, the lab, in a lab, in a somebody's garage, you can. Yeah, or, or, well, there's, we can, we can. <laughs> We can go, I don't want to go into too much about the, whether it's lab leak or natural or not. But so, um, you know, communicating the ethics is definitely something that is necessary right now. There's not a lot of people who communicate bioethics or like ethics of science in the sense of like, oh, can we do this or not? But the thing is that, da that data and the information is already out there publicly at the point that I am talking about it. So. Is, is, it going to, is it going to be like my, my talk is going to be the impetus of somebody doing something like that? I don't think so. I don't think general science communicators are not. If somebody was smart enough to do that, they wouldn't listen to uh, an idiot like me. They would actually go to the research itself and parse it out themselves. Yeah, yeah. It's, there's, there's like, you know, the anarchist cookbook. You know, you, you can, somebody can, you know, needs to know about that to write it, right? <laughs> That you can get it online now, essentially, this way. Awesome. So, yeah, thank you very much uh, for your talk. And I'm sure lots of us will be at the next <laughs> Nerd Night. Just yes. let's have oh. one more round of... Oh, I, want to, I want to mention, um, our next Nerd Night, we have two speakers who will be speaking at that day, um, Laurie Adam. Um, both, both of them, plus somebody who's not here, right? but will be speaking at Nerd Night uh, Kyushu next month on the 22nd. That, that's 22nd. Amazing. We hope to see you there. Thank you. Yeah, another just a